Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Live from the Heartland. I'm your host, Michael Gaylord James, and this is number 170 since the start of the pandemic, and it is for the week of September 16th. We are recording it on September 13th. Uh, we've got some interesting guests coming on today, an old pal, Dan Kugler, and a friend of his, Danielle Jerkowski, talking about Ukraine. And we're going to have Katie Hogan, a sometimes host, a producer of the show. And she's going off on a pretty special journey. She's going to share a little bit about that. And a heads up, on the 23rd, next week's show, we will have the wonderful peace activist, Kathy Kelly. Okay. So a couple of good things that happened this week. For me personally, I got to go back in the swimming pool at the Y, which is closed on its yearly rehab cleanup. It's beautiful in there and it's wonderful to be in the water. And I started teaching again at DePaul, my course activists and activism since 1960, has 29 students this fall. So that's keeping me busy. On the good front, there is a green wave in Mexico and Latin America in general, Argentina too, and I'm talking about abortions. Mexico legalized abortion on a national level. There's been a decline in Catholicism. The anti-abortion people are more in jail than before. There are progressive governments, in, certainly in Mexico, and I think this is a good thing. Mexico is a place that women seeking abortion and can't get it in certain states are going to regularly. Another good thing, I think, was Biden's visit to Vietnam. You know, the U.S. and Vietnam have a long history. We were involved in a terrible war over there for many years. We seem to be working together now for a long time, and I think that's good. I mean, I hope we can make up some of what we did to that country, and we will keep you posted on any of that. Here in Chicago and beyond, people have noticed that Federal funds are being used to buy tickets to send people, you know, immigrants who cross the border, to send them to Chicago and New York. This is not a good thing. It's federal money. It's being used in that way. This whole immigration thing is pretty challenging for everywhere. An awful lot of people are coming. I think uh, Chicago has spent close to $250 million. I've uh, only gotten about $30 million back from the feds. In New York, the mayor, Adams, he basically came out and said immigration will destroy New York City. I thought he was pretty negative. What followed in the reporting on him saying that was how last year New York City handled 18,000 kids in school who have recently arrived. This year, it looks like they're going to have to handle another 20 plus thousand. We'll see. But it is definitely something that we need to work hard at. There's a lot of people throughout the country who feel like there are issues that are not being dealt with by the government, homelessness, food, housing, all kind of things. And then we're having to deal with a whole lot of people coming from other places, coming to the United States where they think things will be better. I'm sure they will get better, but it is something we all have to collectively be aware of and work on. Disasters around the world are a big deal. We all have followed the news about what's going on in Hawaii. We know that there have been wildfires in Europe. There's climate change refugees patterns happening throughout Africa and beyond. We've got a situation where we had earthquake in Turkey. We had a major earthquake in Morocco. And just in the last few days, we've had dams break in part of Libya and probably 6,000 people dead, maybe more. Uh, it's really devastating. And meanwhile, people are using a lot of electricity and helping to contribute to global warming. It's, it's going to bite us big time. It already has. Here in Illinois, starting in January, the new law that was passed, I believe in June, by Governor Pritzker about book banning and, you know, books in being allowed to be in libraries. It is an issue on the uh, Republican GOP presidential front, and they're always encouraging people to get more involved with local elections for school boards, that kind of thing. I think the Democrats and progressives really need to be in on government and boards, that kind of thing at the local level. And we certainly want to encourage an end to this move to ban books. Something that on that note, there was yesterday, that would have been Tuesday, 
here in Chicago and the suburbs receiving bomb threats at libraries. Chicago, Aurora, Addison, and Evanston were, were all targeted by these threats, and uh, nothing was found, no one was hurt. So keep going to the libraries. Libraries are a wonderful thing. Longtime listener to the show and people who are aware about what's going on in our country know that uh, Leonard Peltier, a Native American activist, he has been incarcerated for, I think, 46 years. He'd been eligible for parole since 1993. Uh, a number of people, including Deb Haviland, who is the Secretary of the Interior, have encouraged Biden pardoning Peltier. I don't think that'll happen until after the election, if at all. I was so disappointed Obama didn't do it when he had the chance. Yesterday, hundreds of people, activists and indigenous leaders, rallied outside the White House asking for Biden to grant clemency to this Native American leader. Peter Mathiasen wrote a great book about it. There were some issues that he got sued on, but if you can find it, I would read all about it. Uh, Leonard Peltier is a name to remember, and uh, let's hope we can get him out of jail. He is uh, 79 years old, I believe. And take note of what's going on in Mississippi. Elvis Presley's second cousin, a fellow named Brandon Presley, just won the Democratic primary for governor. He was actually unopposed, and he is not leading in the race for governor, but he apparently has a very good shot. It would be wonderful. Mississippi is kind of a backward state in a lot of ways. It's certainly been a red state. I did see a wonderful documentary on PBS called The Harvest, Integrating Mississippi Schools. And you can get it on PBS. You can watch the full episode. And it talks about integrating this one town in Mississippi. I think it was called Leland back starting in 1970 and the kind of changes that went on in the town the good things that happened, the backlash that happened, the setting up of private Christian schools for white people. Mississippi schools are pretty much segregated today, um, even though there is a law that says they should not be. But I would say check out this documentary. Once again, it's called The Harvest, Integrating Mississippi Schools. And last week, we had a, a pretty nice uh, session. We talked to the director of Illinois Normal, a woman named Margot Vesely. And you can watch that as well as our interview with Jerry Condon and Helen Jacquard from Vets for Peace and the sailboat, The Golden Rule, which is currently in Chicago. You can watch that all at youtube.com slash Heartland Media. All right, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with our first guests, Dan Kugler and Daniel Jerkowski. And we're going to talk a little bit about Ukraine. And then a little bit later, we're going to have our good friend Katie Hogan on talking about an upcoming adventure that she's participating in. You're listening to Live from the Heartland for the week of September 16th. We'll be right back. Uh, welcome back to Live from the Heartland for the week of September 16th. And uh, those people who have been paying close attention to the show know that we had 
on a fellow named Peter Huddis a couple of weeks ago. And he was uh, talking about a wonderful event that took place at uh, Loyola. It was the national tour of Ukrainian and Russian anti-war activists opposed to Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. And uh, Dan Kugler, who is a longtime friend of this show, uh, he's worked as a host, an engineer, et cetera. Uh, I know he's from, uh, he's Ukrainian. I don't think he's from Ukraine more recently, but he he was going to the event too. And I asked him to come on today and give us a little report about how it went and then talk a little bit about what's going on in Ukrainian community here in Chicago and even what he knows because he's got family back there. And he's going to do that, but he also brought on a fellow we're introducing too, is Daniel Jekas, let me say it right, Jerkaski. And uh, he's involved with a group called here in Chicago called Ukraine Trust Chain. So we're going to talk Ukraine for the next 20, 25 minutes. And uh, Dan Kugler, how about filling us in a little bit on the event at uh, Loyola University, resisting, resisting Russian imperialism? Yeah, it was uh, Michael. It's good to see you and to be back involved with the show. So it's great. Nah, now we're doing Zoom. Makes <laughs> um, it easy. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> um, so it was a fantastic event. It was the Ukraine Solidarity Network, and uh, I encourage people to go online, Facebook, and uh, they have a you know web page. It's a recently. Uh, uh, organized organization, uh, essentially by leftists in, in America and Ukraine to kind of uh, counter some of the silence on the left and sometimes opposition to aid for Ukraine. And I think they spoke well to the at the event to the some of the misconceptions uh, about the war, you know, is uh, a lot of people want to look at it as a proxy war with NATO. And uh, there's some issues to be looked at with NATO. But, you know, if you look at the situation really within Russia and Ukraine, you see an increasingly right-wing repressive government in Russia that's, you know, using war rhetoric, rhetoric to justify its power at this point and justify suppression of its people. Uh, so it was a powerful talk. There was two speakers, Hena Perahoda, who was from actually from Donetsk, um, and she's in uh, she's in France now. But she spoke about just the horrors of the war and the invasion, and you know there um, that you know it's not right now. It's in Ukraine. The situation is not about having a perfect leftist or centrist or any sort of feelings about, you know, the invasion. It's it's the fact that there's an invasion going on by a repressive government and against Ukraine and that there's no internal disagreement in Ukraine's left about what to do. Uh, you know, it's a different situation in America. I think the further you get from Eastern Europe, the more divergent the views on the left become. But uh, Ilya Budurakatis also spoke very eloquently. He actually left Russia a week after the invasion of Ukraine. He was an anti-war activist and writer. And he, and we're having dinner afterwards, he just pointed at his backpack and said, I packed this bag and I left the country. So it's uh, they're having a difficult situation over there, too. Dan, let me just ask you before we go on to the other, Daniel, uh, what do you hear from your relatives in Ukraine? And I know you visited there in the last few years, took a lot of pictures. You used to be putting them up on yeah. Instagram all the time. I kept saying I better get my pictures from you to crane scanned. I still want to do that. Uh, but tell do us a, what you got. A dual book or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I last went there in uh, 2020. So it was before COVID, before the the recent invasion. You know, if, if you look at it factually, the invasion first started in 2014, of course. But, um, you know, 
I think, you know, at that time, and I spoke to people, my family lives in Kiev and the surrounding villages mostly. Um, and, you know, they were aware of the war, but it hadn't really touched daily life unless you had someone in the service or you had family from Eastern Ukraine. Um, but since 2022, uh, it's, you know, they, they don't sleep at night. There's air raid sirens going on, you know, and every few days, you know, something, people get bombed and killed. It's a really intense situation. But, um, you know, they're resolved. You know, a lot of my family members get together and pack food to send, you know, to the troops and just, uh, you know, they're in it for the long haul. They'll be tough, but they really feel, you know, confident that they should, you know, go get through this and defend their country. Well, Dan, Dan, one of the things I wanted you to do was talk about uh, what was going on here in Chicago with the Ukrainian community. And you suggested we bring on our new friend, uh, Daniel Jerkowski, and here he is. And he has an organization that's been doing a lot of serious work helping out the situation over there. His group is called Ukraine Trust Chain. So hello to you there, Daniel. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Tell us a little bit about yourself and about your response and uh, how you created this organization and then what it does. Sure. Um, so I myself was born in Kiev and uh, left Ukraine about 25 years ago, right after school, um, and uh, lived a normal immigrant life in the U.S., uh, not thinking a lot about um uh, about the place where I grew up, right? It was like for many immigrants, it was um it was an important part of my childhood, but not something I thought about deeply, right? And uh long story short, um that changed when the invasion happened. Somehow um like with many other people uh, who immigrated from Ukraine or from other former Soviet Union countries felt personally violated and insulted by this invasion, by this colonial war. And uh, it seemed, the picture seemed to be so clear uh, who is right and who is wrong that we all looked for ways to contribute directly. Um, and uh, given that I had uh, connections within Ukraine, had friends, had people that I trusted, um, we figured out a way to uh, build our help uh, for Ukraine so that people that uh, want to get involved with a humanitarian relief effort uh, feel that they actually make direct impact on the ground. So in the very first days when we were just trying to figure out what to do, um, we found through a number of stories that just were accumulating very quickly in the first days of the war, we found that there is a, a whole class, a whole group of people within Ukraine who just dropped everything they were doing and started volunteering. Um, for example, the initial people that were helping were looking for elderly who were trapped after a stroke or heart attacks at home. Their family is flat, flees the city in panic and uh, somebody needed to bring them food, bring them medication while the city was being shelled. And the amazing thing was that there is a whole community that was present in Ukraine prior to this moment that I didn't know about that really opened up and uh, stood up in the very first days. And uh, I was fortunate enough to come into contact with those people. And many of them is somebody that I had a mutual friend 
friends with, uh, people that I was connected to through immigrant community. And it was very clear that these were the people that I trusted, just like I trust uh, people that I grew up with, right? I understand their background, I understand where they went to school. And uh, at the same time, I was integrated into community here. And uh, I think people know where I work, I where my kids go to school. And so it was easy for me to convince people that this was a worthy effort. And uh, especially in the very first days of the war, um, you know, the cost of human life was just, you know, unfortunately, very, very low for like three to four dollars a person, you could save hundreds of people. There were buses that didn't have fuel. You sent $500 over and a hundred people, children, elderly, women were able to make their way out of uh, bombardment zones. Um, but we kept going and uh, because thanks to the compassion and to kind of just general support in Western society for Ukrainian people, um, people continue to donate. And as we provide a sustained funding to this group of uh, volunteers, these volunteers themselves have been able to plan, build organizations, and so forth. And so right now, we just continue to fundraise and support this network of people who do humanitarian work within Ukraine, um, which I think is very effective and because we are professionals working in the US, we do not spend anything on administrative costs and just, just make sure that every cent that we receive goes to the people who know exactly what to do within Ukraine. So that's kind of the story in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, that's really good. How did you develop, uh, I mean, it was through your friendship and I'm sure other ways, this network in Ukraine that's doing the actual delivery of the goods, whether that be helping people to get out or to fuel mm -hmm. a bus or to provide food. Um, my, I guess what I'm sensing is that what you're doing here in the States is raising money. And we could get to that, how we, people could help on that. But then mm -hmm. you've got a number of contacts over there who are doing the work on the ground. Tell mm -hmm. us about how you establish that and who those contacts might be. Yep. Um, so in the in the very first days of the war, it was very easy to spot people. Basically, when millions of people are fleeing west, there were a few people moving east, right? They're moving into the danger areas with cars, with aid. It just takes, I am not, I, I'm afraid I'm not exactly the type of person that that would have had the guts to do it in the first couple of weeks when it was completely uncertain what was going to happen next and uh uh what the way we developed it at first was well there were some random events for example like uh, there were there were a couple of things that just happened my friend for example had two babies, uh, twins that were born in Kiev, and he was in Chicago, and he was trying to find food to get to those babies. And uh, I remember we wrote about this on social networks, just looking for any ways to do it. And all of a sudden, a person shows up in the comments and says, I will go. And we start getting voice memos from her. She's like, oh, you know, expletive deleted. Uh, they just shelled this pharmacy, so I'm gonna go to another one uh, to see that. You know, and once you live through a couple hours of that, um, you know, and at that point we didn't really send any money. It, it was just like, and immediately a trust was established. But as these people keep working, they tell you that okay, my friend who's doing the same thing in Kharkiv needs money for fuel. We establish a connection then, and we then grow a conversation there. So we, there were a couple of events like this, and then we organically grew it. And this, this community is 
connected. They everybody does the same thing. Resources are shared. Um, there is no copyright in the volunteer movement. People just freely share ideas and figure out the most efficient way to help. And so after a couple of uncertain weeks, you just see the context and you, you know, everybody is going to roughly the same places. When it's Bakhmut, people are trying to get as close to Bakhmut as possible. Right now, there is attack on Kupiansk. There are volunteers that push aid into Kupiansk. When there was a flood in Kherson, you know, for weeks, there were the same people there. They're all going to help, uh, after, you know, with various flood relief sites in, in Kherson. So even though it seems far away after spending, like we do, tens of hours a week on this, you just know the context and you know exactly the little events that that happen everywhere and uh um you get a pretty clear sight on things that you can check from many different contexts you have and kind of triangulate the overall situation there what i'm uh what i got from uh some information i was sent to me i think uh dan sent it um he said that uh, Ukraine Trust Chain has been involved in evacuating more than 50,000 people from dangerous parts of Ukraine, and more than a hundred and a million and a half people have gotten aid deliveries uh, through hundreds of projects, whether it be running shelters, rebuilding roofs, etc. Uh, you want to elaborate a little bit on that and how you're are moving people or what you hear from the groups on the ground that you're working with are doing it? Yeah, yeah, it is correct. Where uh, evacuation number, among many other things we do is at 54,000. It's just not something that um, you can manage, right? What, what happens is that there are this really motivated, selfless, individuals who are doing all this heroic work and we support them money that we raise is just it enables them to kind of maximize the effects of their work so some teams are in you know they happen to have vehicles and so for months on they are running evacuation routes where the bus comes into the city People board the bus and they leave. And uh, it reached its peak in the middle of last year, uh, but it is still going on right now. There are a couple of hundred people that need to be evacuated weekly from active battle zones in the East. Because even though the war seems stable, the front line keeps moving and different places uh, get hit. So evacuation works that way uh, and then a lot of people choose to provide support to load trucks with supplies go into areas that are hard to access uh, with items that are very hard to predict that's that's where the the that's when we were thinking about this assembling humanitarian aid and shipping it in uh while it's still relevant it's very difficult on some days there is enough pasta and bread, but people are do not have enough sanitary pads or toothpaste. And it's just something that has to happen in the moment. So we do not tell volunteer teams what to do. We focus on trust and building a relationship with them and understanding why they're doing what they're doing, which informs our next steps and where to grow. Just for the, the people who are listening who are less familiar, uh, what are some of the dangers that the evacuators and, and the evacuees face, if you could describe some situations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the I wouldn't claim to have firsthand experience, but it is a part of the reality. So I just want to make sure that I mm, highlight that I'm just talking about someone else's experience. Uh, it is something that people don't think about is that 
um, artillery has gotten a lot more powerful than it was during World War II. It's uh, um, people sometimes tend to think that if an artillery shell doesn't hit a person directly, that uh, that person is fine. But in reality, there is a 150 feet kill radius uh, for these shells, right? So if you're in that circle, um, you get injured or killed. And so people that evacuate go into the areas that get hit daily. So just, and uh, it's an artillery shell. You have five to seven seconds before the shell hits you. So the and the 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 danger of this people go into this uncertain situation where um the enemy has really good optics uses drones and so forth so so there is a constant risk assessment constant uh dangerous of uh, of doing this like just a couple of days ago we heard about a volunteer group being killed fortunately the groups that we work with take risk very seriously and uh, when the area is too dangerous they make sure that they do not gather people that they they don't have uh, more than one vehicle more than 100 meters apart. there are all kinds of safety rules that they follow in order to minimize risk. And fortunately, nobody we work with directly uh, had, you know, sustained serious damage to date. But it's also important to know that there are forces on the ground that are working against Ukrainians. There are agents of Russian state who are interested in hunting down and you know interested in situation deteriorating from a humanitarian perspective so volunteers unfortunately are fair game at this point as far as the russian military is concerned and so it is a constant factor for volunteers operating in in you know gray zones next to the front line daniel Cherkesky, let me ask you uh we're going to run out of time but i know that you <laughs> have a newsletter that uh, people could get and I'm going to just tell it right now. I believe it's www.ukrainetrustchain, one word, dot org slash newsletter. And you're also on other social media platforms. And for those people who are listening to the show on Saturday morning or got it on YouTube the night before, you, I think, are having an event later today. That would be Saturday the 16th. How about giving me the okay on the directions for the uh, newsletter and tell us about your event? Yep. Thank you so much for mentioning this. Yes, ukrainetrustchain.org is the website where you can support us and follow our updates. In many ways, spreading the word about the work that the volunteers do is more important because the more people know about it, the more people connect to this mission. and. Uh, find it in their heart to support this. Um, we have a very special event this Saturday where one of the volunteer leaders who was involved in evacuations and supports refugee population across Ukraine is actually for the first time coming to Chicago uh, for a week. Uh, and uh, we are organizing a meeting with her in Glenview, Illinois. The address is going to be 976 Harlem Avenue. It is at 11 a.m., so uh, pretty soon, uh, based on the time that you're listening to <laughs> this podcast. Um, so, and it is going to be at Smithana Restaurant in Glenview. Once again, the address is 976 Harlem Avenue. Um, if you and subscribe, that, we hope to have more events like this coming up in the in the next few weeks as we get ready for the winter, you know, and have some of the leaders travel here to discuss the next plans. Well, we'll be glad to promote that a little bit when you keep us abreast of what's going on. And I would like to ask both of you uh, to give maybe give us a a short uh, going out on 
the spirit of the people you're in touch with. Are people optimistic? Are they in mm -hmm. an enduring mode? Are are people getting down? I mean, this is pretty heavy, serious stuff. Been going on for quite a while now, and uh, you know, it seems pretty heroic to me. But I just wonder what you sense from your people you're in touch with. Um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, be the first in this. Um, my sense is this: people who are involved day to day, first, it's clear that who is right and who is wrong here, right? Ukrainians are fighting to protect their children and and uh, their parents and uh, exist in society that welcomes different opinions and and so on. So um, they are not optimistic that the war will end very soon. Um, right. But they know exactly what to do tomorrow and next week and two weeks from now. I think that's the mode that we're all in. We know exactly what to do next. We're not sure how long we will need to be doing this for. That's that's where we are right now. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. And I want to thank the two Dans. That's G Daniel Cherkasky and Dan Kugler. Dan, I assume you'll be back on so show soon. You've been helping out again. And yeah. uh, Daniel Cherkasky, I hope to meet you in person. And you know, <laughs> you're doing great work. Keep it up. Thank you. All right, everybody, stay tuned Thanks. here on the left end of your dial or however you're getting the Live from the Heartland show. We'll be right back with our longtime co-host, producer, good friend, Katie Hogan. She's going on a trip. She's going to share a little bit of information and we'll grill her about politics. Be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the next segment on this week's Live from the Heartland for the week of September 16th. And I know a lot of you have been waiting till Katie Hogan, a longtime co-host, co-producer of this show, would come back on. Um, she's been very busy. You know, she's always doing a lot of political work. She and I are working on the Heartland Cafe book, and we're very glad to say that it is coming along. And uh, Katie is actually uh, taking a leave from all the activities she's involved with, and she's going on a spiritual journey. <laughs> Since I've known you, Katie Hogan, you've taken a lot of interesting trips, climbing mountains, going into jungles, you know, hitchhiking around, fighting off would-be attackers. Tell me what you got planned for this trip. <laughs> Always interesting to hear what your version of all that is. Um, Hi, good day, Michael. Nice to see you. And um, tomorrow I'm uh, getting on a plane, hopefully, neck on wood, everything goes well, and going to Spain, where I will join up with a group uh, from called Ananda Travel that uh, are the same people I went to India with a few years ago. They are a, a spiritual group that um, puts together these journeys to spiritually uh, 
engaged places. So this time it'll be to go to the Camino in Spain, uh, the famous and ancient pilgrimage that uh, went that goes to Santiago Compostela, which is St. James Field of Stars at Field of Stars, Compostela. And it's been participated in for centuries, literally, like uh, since a, a thousand AD, um, when somebody began to mark the, uh, the way. The entire way, I mean, the minimum of the entire way is 500 miles, 600 kilometers. Um, it starts just at the bottom of France, right before the Pyrenees, climbs the Pyrenees, and comes in across the top of Spain. I, however, will be doing the old geezer route, um, <laughs> which is uh, shorter, and uh, it's the last 100 kilometers. Um, I've read a lot of uh, back talk about people like me who are only doing 100 kilometers, and I don't think it's very pilgrimage-like <laughs> of people to make mock us, but anyway, I'll deal with that when it comes. Uh, we both have a friend who's on it right now, and it looks like she's doing the whole thing. Um, and that's, uh, well, maybe she'll come on the show again and tell you about that when she's done. Um, in any that's case, it. to me, uh, uh, to do a thing like this, to sign on to do a pilgrimage or some other um, not explicable to the rest of the world, you know, you're not going to a beach and laying on it, you're not touring uh, a big old buildings, although we will do a lot of that. I will see like the biggest uh, and most, I think, still intact um, uh, center for the Knights Templar of the Illuminati. Um, it, historically, it's an incredible place. I mean, um, and for me, uh, the okay, I didn't finish the first sentence. I go to have um, self-illumination. I go to unite with the big S soul the biggest spirit of the entire gestalt. Um, I don't care what you call it, and I'm not in any specific religious denomination um, paying attention. Although I was raised Catholic with a big C and um, know all about that ritual and rhyme. And, you know, pretty early in my life, after I discovered that the parish pastor on my Southside parish was um, an unapologetic racist, uh, he, he convinced me um, to uh, check other other roads, other forms, and that I did. And so I have been, as you said, I've gone to India and done Hindu-related stuff. I got a yoga teacher training certificate. A lot, a lot of that was in um, uh, Sanskrit, uh, what I learned there. I've done, I've walked with Buddhists in Nepal and um, Native American uh, like vision quest activities here in the States. And I just find that taking time off to do nothing more than uh, open yourself up to the, 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 both the natural world and your own inner world in, in conversation with the natural world is, an, is a mighty force and it brings me peace and it brings me strength and um, lets me get rid of some of the extraneous BS that uh, troubled us so much in, in our you know, normal lives here. Well, let me ask you a question here. Um, <laughs> how have you been preparing? I know you've been working hard at a job, and I also know that you've been doing physical training. Fill us in on what you've been up to and how you uh, prepare and think you're ready for this great journey. Right. Well, it is walking, and it's a lot of walking. Even even the short amount I'm doing is a lot of walking, and you do need to be prepared for that. In fact, I just came back from having a pedicure, which um, is I had to let her know, do not touch the calluses on my feet. Leave the calluses. <laughs> they are hard one. I, what I would, did need help with was, you know, trimming my toenails so that they don't burst through the very uh, specific socks that you've got to wear so that you don't get uh, too many blisters. So it's learning about blisters. It's learning about what your feet can take. I've been uh, walking with walking sticks in the last couple of weeks, which will greatly aid me from 
you know, the possibility of falling over. I recommend them to you, Buster. Um, but Thank you. <laughs> they do. They're 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 very stabilizing, and they take some of the weight off my uh, joints as you're going up or downhill. Um, so the other thing is that I've done a lot of reading, uh, a lot of other uh, points of view on um, pilgrimage, a lot of specific to the Camino books, um, and uh, you know I, I cleaned my, up my act in the last couple of weeks in a couple of ways. Um, to clear my head, as it were. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that seems to be happening. Um, well, I gotta say, it's been pretty impressive to watch how much you walk. Um, I know you've been putting in five, six, seven miles most days. And well, so I yeah, don't know, I'm how gonna... far will you be walking each day on that Camino? Uh, we'll be walking, and this is, again, this is the short version. We'll be walking between uh, five and nine miles a day. It's very comfortable. It's made for us old geezers. Um, the people who are doing it all the way from the front, they walk um, 15 to 25 kilometers a day, which is a minimum of nine miles. So they start their day at my minimum, my maximum. Um, so that would be something that I'd really have to work on. Although a lot of people just take their first step in the in the uh, on the path itself and just warm up and get themselves used to it by doing it, um, which is a very brave way to go and something probably I could do easier when I was in my 30s, 40s, and 50s. But not now. Do they uh, do they uh, give you a, an idea about how long you'll be walking each day and do you stop at various restaurants or do they bring food to you? I, know, I imagine that you stay somewhere each night and you're your backpack, your suitcase, whatever, goes ahead and is right. waiting for you when you arrive. Right. Yeah, The because this whole trip for me is going to wind up being a month, I have a, a rolling suitcase that will ride in the bus from one stop to the next, and I will be having just a day pack with what I need for the walk, water and whatever. Um and yeah, so we start out in, we all start out in the same, whatever place we've stayed in, generally have breakfast. Lunch is up to us. Um, they give a lot of help in pointing out that there are many stops or a few on various walks to find lunch, but our distances are so short. We can, you know, actually wait to eat lunch until we get to the town we're going to. So um, there's a lot of options. It's not going to be a terribly, you know, scary or anything like that. And at the end of the day, you normally eat where you're staying or within a very short, in the village next to where you're staying. So, um, Katie Hogan, world traveler, how many days will you be walking the Camino? Uh, I will be walking a total of 11 days. Um, we take, we have a rest day in the middle after five or six and then and then actually we do go to the end. There's something at the end. Um, the the Compostela, the Santiago is a, where the cathedral is and a lot of stuff happens there. And for many people, that's it. But Wuxia and Finisterre, which means end of the earth, are the real ends of the Camino at, at the Atlantic Ocean. So we will in fact add to our, our walking after taking a short bus ride to make it a shorter walk, I guess, um, when we get to the ocean. So 12 days, say, walking, all to all toll. Well, you're going to uh, develop your and enhance your spirituality, your physical fitness, and you're going to come back to Chicago, mm -hmm. right here in the middle of the United States. And what do you see coming back? I mean, you're a political person. We've got elections coming up, but not only in the city, uh, but nationally, you know, just a little over a year from now. You got any plans? You got any hopes? Well, part of why I, I'm doing this walk now is that I won't be able to do it next year at this time when we are uh, facing yet again um, a crucial presidential election um, and also for Congress and Senate. So, um, I may well be working when I come back on some local uh, electoral work, um, 
basically <laughs> what I do is try and get people to vote. I try and organize people who understand it's important to vote to organize others to understand that it's important to vote. And it's, um, uh, it's annoying <laughs> that it's still so necessary, particularly when the, the stakes are so high and have been for the last half dozen elections, frankly, but even more so in the last two or three, we have a, we have a lot at stake and we have a, a country um, that is completely confused with itself right now. Um, and I, I think that people need to, we all need to, and I hope I learn something when I'm walking about stepping away from the, the um, duality of the simplistic duality of the conversation in the U.S. right now. It's, it shouldn't be us, you're either with us or against us. I mean, how many of us grew up in towns or cities and neighborhoods where there were people of two different parties plus some independents living right up the street? We could talk to each other. We could shovel each other's walks. We could play ball together. Um, I don't accept that America is so afraid so afraid of one another or or the unknown that they're you know holding up with their guns and bible and whatever else and uh not talking to each other um first of all you don't own the bible second of all a whole bunch of leftists have guns um and and just stop because you know this whole migrant thing for example that's going on and i just read either in in Black Club or uh, Public Square, one of those two good sources of local news that uh, some Dems have been quoted as saying, oh, the migrant uh, crisis or will not affect our uh, convention in Chicago. Well, hmm. I want to know why not. I mean, it should affect it. It should be talked about. It should be pointed to. And it should be asked as opposed to assault and attack, which I know everybody is so into doing, thank you, social media, um, uh, that we should talk about it. We should talk about what it has meant to be Northern cities who actually are standing behind our claim of being sanctuary places and, and what, that, what that looks like. Because guess what, fellow Americans, just like New York, we might be filled up soon and we might have to send them to I don't know, Iowa, Indiana, somewhere else where there's actually possibly work and some shelter for them. Um, I'm I'm trying desperately not to be overly disappointed with my fellow Americans kind of all the time right now. And the way I do that is to look at our neighbors who have made place for migrants who are working to clothe and feed and shelter them and all that sort of thing. Um, and I, you know, those are the people who give me hope uh, that I can't abide and I can't look at social media uh, uh, very deeply because it's it's too uh, it's too demoralizing, really, for someone like me. But for our elections coming up in March, it's a primary, it's a general primary, so it's not so much city people on the ballot like we had last year. It's um, uh, Congress people, uh, state senators. Um, uh, state reps, uh, commissioners of the Metropolitan Waters Reclamation District. Um, when will that election be? That election is Tuesday, March 19th. And so what's going on in the fall, and you'll see it happening right away, is people are collecting signatures for their nominating petitions. Everybody who gets on the ballot, all, all people, including delegates to the convention, and judges and whatever all, they need to get signatures to get on the ballot. Um, so that's that'll be happening from now until uh, the early part of the year when they have to turn them in. And then, um, yeah, and then it will be, you know, the noise and detritus of a presidential election will take over everybody's minds. And, um, you know, we have, we have presumably a picked Democratic candidate, which is the president. Um, and so the Republicans dance will probably get the most um, coverage, um, uh, such as it will be. Um, and, you know, I pray for America. I, I hope we I hope we can um, mature this year. 
we're yeah. gonna we're gonna get through it. And uh, you know, you and I tend to be optimistic. Uh, we have friends that aren't, but uh, yes. everyone is involved in trying to make things better. And we know that you uh, you've played a great part all along the way from the day I met you. You've been something else. Uh, I want to thank you for being my partner in the Heartland, the Heartland Journal, this radio show. And um, I'm looking forward to you coming back really strong, really healthy, full of enlightenment and ready to tear it up on the electoral front. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate all of that. Love you dearly. <laughs> I'm very excited that our book is uh, is in manuscript form. So congratulations. And that makes me feel good to go off knowing that that's uh, where we're at. Right on. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to thank Dan Kugler and Dan Cherkowski told us about the Ukraine trust chain. I want to certainly thank uh, Hal James, our uh, engineer, as well as our other producers, Lynn Orman and Tom Clark. We've got Kathy Kelly coming on next week. She's going to talk to us about people in Afghanistan and how she's been helping out on that. And I'm sure we'll have plenty of other things to talk about. So you all do good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do. All power to the people. All power to the people. See you next week. All right. How you doing the best you can? Under the big blue sky, you got a dream awaiting. I can see it in your eye. It may not come easy, but you know you've got a friend. I'll be by your side the entire ride. Just let me hear you say, Amen. Are you doing, doing? Are you doing the best you can? Tell me, are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Mm -hmm. Too done, est-ce que too done, le meilleur de toi-même, parce que tu l'aimes. Too done, est-ce que too done, le meilleur de toi-même. Can. Tell me, are you doing?